Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar uh, about the E2 visa options where the investment um, amount is low or risky and other risky cases. So my name is Hugh Plessis. I'm a senior associate at Scott Legal PC, and I'm joined today by Dustin Saldariaga, another senior associate at Scott Legal PC as well, with a wealth of knowledge about the E2. So it's gonna be a good presentation today. Um, just a few things before we start with the presentation. Um, as you may know, um, uh, Scott Legal PC was actually started on an E2 visa by our founder, Ian Scott. Um, and uh, renewed as well the E2 visa. So we have a, a very specific, uh, you know, expertise in that uh, field um, based on that experience from a founder. Um, and we deal with a lot of E2 visa. You know, we are a full service immigration law firm, but we sort of have a focus on E2 visas, including risky cases. Um, a few things as well about the presentation today. So presentation is recorded um, and it will be made available um, on demand on our YouTube channel that also has uh, a lot of good, uh, you know, short form and long form content as well about US immigration topics. So I would recommend to check this out. Um, after the presentation today, we will send you an email with a link uh, uh, for the recording. Uh, we will also include our E2 comprehensive guide it's very helpful. And then a link to sign up to other webinars that we are doing you know, very frequently, at least uh, a few times a month about US immigration topics, you know, TN visas, E2, screen cards, etc. So I would highly recommend to sign up for those. Um, and then if you have any specific questions about your case, interested in engaging us for an E2 visa or any other um, questions about US immigration. You can also set up a consultation with uh, our attorneys on our website. Uh, there's gonna be some information on that uh, in that email after the presentation as well. Um, and then if you have any questions about what we're gonna go through today, I would recommend you just typing your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function, and then we'll go through all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so we'll have some time for that. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, you know, the requirements for the E2 visa. So first requirement here is that you must be a national of a treaty country. That's sort of the basis here. And national of a treaty country means that you must have a passport from a country that has signed a treaty with the United States, uh, the United States, and that would include that E2 visa provision in there. So. There's actually a lot of countries uh, with uh, uh, treaties uh, with the US um, on our continents. Um, you know, very common um, countries that we see would be Canada, uh, Mexico, uh, France, for example, or, you know, um, uh, there's ups, there are some new additions as well from time to time. So Israel has been added uh, fairly recently. So what I would recommend to do to check if you would qualify is go into the Department of State's website. They actually have a list of all the countries that have signed a treaty with the US and that would qualify for an E2 and just make sure that your country is in there. Um, some exceptions and also some inclusion, exclusions that are worth noting would be Russia, for example, or Brazil. So if you're a national of those countries, you would not qualify for an E2 unless you are a dual national of another country that has a treaty with the US. For example, if you're from Brazil, but you also have uh, dual nationality with Italy, for example, then you would uh, you may qualify for the E2 based on that nationality. So that's the first requirement here that we're going to be on the lookout for. Second requirement uh, is that the applicant for the E2 must own at least 50% of the E2 company. So the E2 company would be the business that you are starting in the US or the business that you're purchasing in the US. But um, the applicant, in order to be successful, must at least own 50% of that business really important stuff. So you, you need to provide evidence of that ownership. Um, that's a big part of the application. Um, and I will go over that a little bit later on in detail as well. Third requirement here would be that the, you must make an investment. You know, the E2 visa at the end of the day is a, an investor visa. So that's a huge part of the application as well. And the investment, uh, I'm gonna go through some, some information here about the investment because it, it is a very big part of the application process and some things that I wanna to touch base on. The funds first must be at risk. So that means that the money is actually already spent in the business. Um, and it's not just sitting on the bank account 
to be invested later on in the US uh, entity. You must have spent that money to set up the business or buy the business in the US to be considered at risk. That's very important. Um, source of funds is also something that we're going to be on the lookout for and something that you need to document. So the funds must come from a legitimate source you know, savings, gift, uh, could be a loan as well, uh, uh, sell a house, for example. Loans are uh, something that we want to uh, maybe review a little bit more carefully because there are some requirements about loans, whether or not it's a secured loans or uh, a secured loan or an insecured loan. So something that we can, you know, help us uh, uh, with that as well. We can definitely uh, review that for, for your case if you have any questions about it. But source of fund is also something that we're going to document and, you know, a trail of funds, make sure that the investment um, is coming from a legitimate source and we have documents showing that. The level of scrutiny about the source of funds will depend whether or not you're applying for the visa at a consulate or you're applying for an E2 status with USCIS, um, you know, but our, but our team can help with determining the level of scrutiny depending on the case. Um, the investment must be substantial as, as well. So uh, whether or not an investment is substantial depends on a test that's uh, uh, completed by the either the, the government or the, the US consulate. Um, and I will go over the test a little bit later on, but uh, it must be a substantial investment regarding the amount of money spent. Um, and then the, the investment must be in, you know, expenditures that are actually related to the E2 business. And I'm going to talk about a little bit later on uh, and differentiate uh, good to sort of bad, quote unquote, uh, E2 expenditures. Good E2 expenditures would be, for example, here where we have a, a list of um, good expenditures would be, you know, inventory equipment, website, marketing, business setup. Uh, legal fees as well. I'll go over that a little bit later on, but all those are good expenditures that would be included in an investment for an E2. Um, and a quick note here, we have a bullet point about the difference between starting and purchasing a business for the investment. So if you are, you know, if you're investing in a, in a startup, uh, you, you have to spend the money necessary to set up that entity and then have it running. If you're purchasing a business, what you can actually do is Sort of coordinate with the setup of the business in the US to set up an escrow account where you will put the investment on. And the um, condition for the, the release of the money from that escrow account must be that you uh, will be approved uh, for the E2 visa. So this is sort of a protection for the, the investor in case the E2 is denied, uh, something that you can look into. So as for the third requirement, investment, a, a big chunk of what the application will include. And then the, the fourth requirements that we, the requirement that we have here is going to be that the business cannot be marginal. So what we mean by marginal in, in the case of an E2 would be that the business uh, will have to support not only the E2 applicant and their family, but also employees, U.S. workers in the U.S. So um, cannot be just a one-man shop. You know, it has to be uh, a company company. Uh, capable of supporting US workers. That's going to be, uh, that information will be in the business plan and, and on other documents in the application. But essentially, it is about whether or not the company will be able to hire US employees, or maybe the company has already hired uh, US employees, that there would be good evidence there. Um, we usually recommend to have uh, three to four um, employees at the end of the, the five year you know, um, uh, run of the company that's in the business plan. I will go over that a little bit later on as well, but that's a, usually a good rule of thumb. But um, yeah, marginality is really important. That will especially come into play when you're going to renew uh, or extend your E2 if you have to. Um, the government or the consulate will look into whether or not the, the E2 business is able to support uh, not only the investor and the family, but also US workers. Um, fifth requirement listed here is going to be that the business must be real and operating. What we mean by that is that the, re the, the business, um, if they're doing uh, uh, you know, business already in the US or will be doing business in the US, and we can show that by 
uh, you know, providing evidence that the E2 company is already taking revenue, um, or ready to start operating after the E2 is granted because they have secured a lease, for example, they have established a business uh, entity, company website is up and running, um, contracts are lined up with uh, prospective customers as well, maybe the licenses that are required to operate are already acquired with the FDA, for example, you know, so all that would be good evidence that the, the business is real and operating. Um, the, the, the sixth requirement here is going to be that the E2 applicant, um, so the investor, must be in a position to um, develop and, and direct the E2 enterprise. So that's a very good, uh, the very, good, very important point here is that you must come to the US um, to develop and, and direct the E2 company and not work for another entity or, you know, have, have something else to do in the US. You must come to, uh, uh, for the E2 business, uh, uh, for the benefit of the E2 business, and you must be well positioned to develop and, and direct the company as well. That's something that we're going to establish in the application based on the applicant's background, education, showing that they are well positioned to develop and, and direct the company in the US. And the last requirement here is going to be about the non-immigrant intent and uh, the intent to return to the home country upon the expiration of the E2 visa. So I was mentioning earlier that the E2 visa is a non-immigrant visa. It is not a green card. It's not a permanent uh, visa. You know, it's just a temporary work authorization. So a really important part of the process is that you show you have your intent, you, you have the intent of returning to your home country after the visa is expired or after your status is expired. Um, so that's also something we're gonna document the application process. Um, next, I'm gonna just uh, dive a little bit uh, into the, those requirements, provide a little bit more information about who can apply and how long does the E2 visa last? Because that's a very common question you get. So as I was just saying, the treaty investor visa E2 is a non-immigrant visa allowing nationals of certain countries to come to the US uh, for the purpose of uh, developing and directing operations of a E2 business, an E2 business um, in which they have invested in. Um, so you have a couple of options for the E2 visa. I think we've touched based on that already. Uh, you can purchase an existing business um, or you can start a business uh, from uh, scratch, you know, setting up the entity in the US, registering an LLC, incorporating a corporation, that sort of thing. Um, and then very important, something that uh, might be tricky in some cases, as I was mentioning before, but you must be a treaty of, a, a, you must be, uh, must be a citizen of a, a treaty country between, uh, you know, with, with a treaty between the US and, and your home country, country uh, of which you are, possess the passport. So uh, again, the list is on the DOS website, Department of State's website, we recommend going through it, making sure that you qualify for that. And then, you know, we, we can also explore the, the options of having dual nationality if the, if the country of birth, uh, for example, is not listed on there. So for some immigration uh, processes, country of birth is important. In that case, for the E2, it's going to be the country uh, uh, from which you have your passport. That's really important. And then some uh, questions that we get is about the duration of the E2. And I think a lot of conf confusion stems from the difference between the duration of stay in the US and the validity of a visa. So um, a visa is a travel document. You get a visa at a US consulate outside of the US and it allows you to get in the US and work for the E2 business. Um, a visa can be valid from three months up to five years and that depends on your country of application. So the country um, on your passport. Um, the duration of a visa based on, on the country, that's that's uh, uh, stems from the reciprocity schedule that's issued by the Department of State. And it's public. You can go onto the Department, Department of State's website. You just type in Google, you know, Department of State reciprocity schedule. And then you'll see that there is a reciprocity schedule. Um, and that includes um, all the countries. And then you click on your country and you check for the E2 specifically, how long the visa is going to be valid for. For example, um, if you are from Canada, um, the E2 visa will be valid for five years. 
if you're from France, it's going to be four years. So it, it depends on, on the country of the passport. And also it changes from time to time. So we highly recommend to check that reciprocity schedule frequently. Um, it is based on the reciprocity between the US and, and the country of issuance for the passport. So that changes uh, quite a lot. Um, and so that's about visa validity. That's, that's how long your travel document is valid for. However, that does not mean that the E2 status in the US is going to be valid for three months or five years, for example. The E2 status in the US will always be valid for two years at a time. And that's based on another document that's going to be issued by Customs and Border Protection when you're going to enter the US. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because it's not the, the topic uh, at hand today, but essentially when you're going to travel to the US with your, with your E2 visa, you're going to be inspected at the border by Customs and Border Protection. They will issue an I-94 showing that you know, you've know you entered the US on E2. And that I-94 will have the validity of your status in the US. And that's going to be two years that you can renew um, either by filing an application with the government, USCIS, from within the US to extend your stay. Or if your visa is still valid, for example, you're from Canada, you have a five-year visa, uh, you've stayed for two years in the US, then you can travel and then re-enter on the same visa that's still valid to extend your stay in the US. You know, granted, um, you're still working for the same company, et cetera. But um, that's essentially the difference between the status and, and the visa, something that you have to keep in mind. Um, if the visa is expired, uh, you'll have to travel to uh, uh, another country to renew it if you want to re-enter the US. Really important uh, to think about it. Um, and then, you know, depending on your case, we will also assist um, to decide whether or not to apply with USCIS from within the US or at a consular. It is sort of a strategic question as well, it depends on your case and the, the facts of, of your case specifically. Um, next, I'm gonna just go over how much investment is enough because that's also a very common question we get for the investment. So as, as I was saying before, part of the requirement uh, to get an E2 is that you have invested a substantial amount of money. There is unfortunately no proper definition or a set amount um, in the regulations to be considered substantial for, for the investment. So we sort of have to run the uh, a proportionality test that I'm gonna go over a little bit later on. And also it will depend on the, the type of business you're gonna open or purchase in the US. For example, it, that's a very common case we have. If you are planning on setting up a consulting firm in the US, for example, that amount of money that you're gonna invest in the business might be fairly low. You might not just need a few computers, you know, maybe a phone, um, a, a, a small office, and that's about it. So uh, it's gonna be different if you are setting up that type of business compared to, for example, uh, opening a restaurant in the US or a bakery or a trucking company for which you have to buy trucks. You know, that's gonna be a, a very different amount that would be considered substantial. Whether or not the investment is substantial, again, is not based on the amount itself. It, it is based on a test that's run by uh, the consulate or um, the immigration services in the US. And it depends on whether or not you're gonna start a company or you're gonna buy a business. So the test when you are starting a company is how much money you have invested versus what they are, what the uh, actual costs uh, to establish the type of business are. So the higher, the, uh, the lower the cost uh, you need to have invested in that business, the higher the proportion invested uh, uh, must be. So for example, if you are setting up a consulting business in the US and you only need $80,000 to set up that business, for example, then you, you need to have invested close to 100% of the 80,000 to be considered substantial um, based on that test. If you're investing in a $100 million business, for example, then investing only 10% might be considered substantial because of the, the higher amount invested or needed for, for the business. So the, again, the, you know, the lower the, the costs uh, to establish the business, the higher the proportion, the, the proportion uh, uh, spent must be. Um, and then when you buy a business, it is a little bit of a different test um, that the, the government uh, or the consulate will run. It's about purchase price versus the fair market value of the business. So if you're buying a business on the open market, usually it's going to be the fair, fair market value. If you are buying um, the business from a friend or someone you know, for example, 
then we would recommend to have evidence that uh, supporting that it is a fair market value of that business, maybe a CPA letter, you know, that sort of thing, making sure that you, you will um, go through that proportionality test for, for buying a business in the US. So very common question that we get about the amount, we will run the test, determine whether or not it's substantial. Something that also to note here is the amount is important, but the categories that you're going to invest that money and the amount in, that's also going to be very important. We want to make sure that you're investing in uh, a plethora of categories that are needed to start the business. If you are going to be selling goods in the US, you can't just invest in inventory and that's it. You'll have to also invest in marketing. Uh, you know, uh, mark, uh, ad advertising, for example, or you have to have some computer equipment, a lease, maybe a truck if you're going to, you know, use that for, for your product. So you need to make sure that you are investing a substantial amount, but it, it's also in multiple um, categories needed to set up the business. Um, strategies to deal with a low dollar amount. So something that we touched on a little bit uh, already, but if the amount would be considered low uh, after the, the test and, and depending on the business, then that not that doesn't mean that automatically it's not a good application. But what we you we want to do and you want to do when you apply is stress other factors that are positive about the application. Could be your experience running a successful similar company um, in the US or abroad, for example. Maybe you already have employees in the US. Uh, it could be that you've lined up contracts with uh, customers. You have letters of intent from clients um, saying that they're going to buy your products or engage the company for their services, for, for its services, for example. You can also you know, draft a strong business plan with projections about uh, future revenue and, and opportunities, providing more information about um, the market you're going to be in the US. Maybe you're going to dominate the market uh, after a few years because of how you're going to strategize you know, in the US, uh, how you run the business or based on your experience, for example. Uh, so you want to make sure that you are focusing on other elements of the application apart from the dollar amount invested. It could also be based on the business, what, what you're actually going to be doing in the US. Maybe it is sort of a new field, a new market. Um, you are operating drones, for example, in a specific uh, you know, uh, field, uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, agricultural drones. That's, that's you know, those sort of fringe markets where you're going to be making an impact because of your expense, for example. That's, that's a very good, um, uh, that's, that's something that you definitely want to stress. Uh, and and uh, that may help if you have a low dollar amount. Um, so that's something that we can work on with you as well. Um, if you need assistance, um, drafting a, a strong business plan, for example, uh, that's something that you really want to have. Uh, it's part of the requirement, but also if you have a low dollar amount, that's something you want to focus on, you know, a hiring plan for, for US employees, that sort of thing. So um, it is uh, not because you have a low dollar amount that you can apply, it's just that you have to uh, strategize and, and make sure that you have other factors that are positive about the application. Um, about investment again, um, some common E2 visa expenditures that we are seeing and are, are good. And I'm going to go uh, a little bit more uh, into what are good expenditures and what are sort of bad, quote unquote, like weak expenditures for uh, E2 visa purposes. So Good expenditures, we have a list here. And again, you, you'll have that presentation uh, after the webinar, so you can go through it. But those are very common. That's what we see on a day-to-day -day basis for all types of businesses. Um, you know, first thing would be usually a lease um, you know, or for offices or a warehouse, for example, depending on the business. Um, what you want to make sure when you are including the lease and, and the rent in the E2 application is that the money is spent. And we, we've seen that already. Money must be at risk. So for rent, for example, uh, you can pay month in advance, maybe a, a few months in advance. You can, you can do that or you can also include the deposit. Um, that's something that you can do um, for uh, lease. So that, that's really something that we want to include and not just the lease agreement. That's not going to be enough. You need to make sure that the money is at risk. Um, something that we see as well fairly often is going to be computer equipment, printers, scanners, tablets, iPads, phone plans as well, very common. Um, website setup and hosting, 
uh, want to make sure that you have a website um, and you know, maybe you've been helped by uh, a PR team for the website. So you can use that, uh, those expenditures as well. Um, of course, you have some um, expenditures related to uh, uh, you know, the office space as well. Um, could be you know, furniture, for example, um, or um, you know, setting up uh, electricity, you know, electricity bills, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then other fees, depending on the case, would be trademark, um, IP related expenditures. Um, could also be that you are spending money on training. That's sort of a, a more risky uh, uh, expenditure that I would recommend, you know, checking whether or not that would apply. Uh, some restrictions are actually at play here, but uh, could be included. Uh, we're listing here as well some licensing fees. Very helpful if you have a, a business that requires uh, a license to operate, for, for example, from the FDA, uh, you can you know, include that. Um, other thing that you can include, and that might be a little bit surprising, but would be legal fees uh, for setting up the business. If you've been helped by a law firm to set up the LLC, for example, you can use that, or if you've been helped getting the E2 visa as well, something that you might think about including. Um, software also listed on there, very good uh, uh, expense to include. Car truck um, we're listing here. It depends, as I was saying before, on the, the company. So if it's just a car that the company is buying uh, for the employees to commute, that's not going to work. But if it is uh, a car truck that's actually needed um, to deliver food or if you are setting up a, a taxi service, for example, then definitely include that. Um, so that's usually what we see in terms of uh, expenditures that we would list. Uh, you know, in the E2, you will include an investment schedule with the details for all the, invest the investment and the expenditures in all those categories. And I was saying before, um, you know, the more categories you have invested in, the better. Um, so that's that's something to be on the lookout for. Um, next, I'm going to go over what are considered sort of weaker expenditures or expenditures that we would not include. Um, that would be travel flights. That's something that we have uh, that come, you know, come, comes up fairly frequently with our clients, whether or not travel to and from the US to actually set up the business uh, could be included. And the, the answer is no, you cannot include that. Related to that as well, travel accommodations listed here. Um, also something you don't want to include. Meals as well, transportation to and from the business entertainment as well not be not included um, expenses directly reimbursed by a client customer also something to be on the lookout for you know if you're buying something from a customer to then sell it again to them that's not going to be uh, included um, and expenses paid to related parties that's interesting so if you have a, a brother who is very good at designing websites for example and uh, they are designing a very good website for the e2 business you're paying them a large sum of money that might be something uh, that's going to be flagged by the government uh, as an expenditure that might not be included. So when you're going to you know, apply for the E2, you need to go through all the expenditures, um, setting aside those that will not be included, and then go through, go through the acceptable expenditures, making sure that they cover a you know, few categories, um, office, uh, you know, lease, uh, as I was saying before, trademark, licensing fees, um, you know, uh, computer equipment, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, very uh, uh, important uh, stuff here about the, the investment. The last thing that I want to touch base on before um, uh, turning it over to testing is going to be about common challenges that we see uh, and the tips related to that for consulting businesses. So. I think I covered that already, but uh, this is a very common type of E2 that we process about consulting services in, in the US, consulting business. Um, and usually our clients would say that they don't need to invest that much. You know, theoretically, as we're listing here, very low investment is needed to start a consulting business in the US. Maybe you just need a computer, a laptop, and, and your experience. However, um, the E2 visa at the end of the day, is still uh, an investor visa. So you have to show that you're investing the amount of money that's going to be substantial, that's going to be required to set up the business, and you're committed to uh, operating that enterprise in the US. So you still have to establish that investment, uh, even if it's a low amount. And as we were saying before, you can focus on other aspects of the business to uh, counter that uh, issue with the low amount. Um, what we usually advise our clients would be to spend money on items that 
you would have spent on uh, regardless uh, in maybe maybe it's going to be um, in, in, at the end of the first year or maybe in a couple of years so invest that now um, and include it in, in the investment schedule and in the e 2 the application could be office space uh, for example equipment um, you can invest in marketing for for future purposes you know run ads on facebook for example or run ads on the internet uh, you can hire a few employees uh, maybe you were thinking about hiring an employee a few months in the us but maybe you want to uh, sort of revisit that and and, and uh, hire an employee now to be able to include the expenditures related to that employee you know salaries obviously but also payroll related expenses all of that can be used as investment uh, for a consulting business. Um, and we're listing here again, the advice of uh, spending over a large number of categories. That's really, really important. So that's uh, our, uh, the common challenges that we see and, and our tips for consulting businesses. Again, invest that money, invest a little bit more than expected uh, over the, the, the course of the maybe, you know, investment that you are thinking about in the next two years, maybe you want to do it now so that you can present it to the, the consulate or the government, and that will definitely strengthen the application. Um, so I think that was it in terms of uh, uh, information I wanted to provide on that, and now I will turn it over to Dustin for the rest of the presentation. All right. Thank you, Hugh. So great information. Uh, now we'll switch to another category that's particularly challenging. Uh, Hugh spoke about the consulting companies and the reason they are particularly challenging, as he mentioned, is they usually don't require a lot of money. Um, and in spite of that, the government does want to see that a substantial investment has been made. So the reason that a real estate investment is difficult is, is slightly different. Um, really, and, and after this slide, we'll talk about equity investments, so stocks. The reason that that both of these are difficult is that there is an E2 requirement, which, which you mentioned, uh, which is that the business needs to be real and operating. So when the government sees a real estate company, their default is to assume that it is a real estate investment company. And what that means is that Essentially, property is being purchased and held onto with the hope that it will appreciate in value. Um, what that means from an E2 perspective, the reason that's a problem is that you don't actually need to employ people for that. Uh, someone with an hour uh, a day or even a few minutes a day could just purchase property and let it sit and wait for it to appreciate. So what you need to make sure to do in your E2 application, if you have a real estate related company, you need to make it especially clear that this is a company that will require the work of US workers. So how do you do that? Um, you need to show for example, uh, um, here's, we'll, we'll share some ideas. So, so when I say that the government defaults to assuming that, that a real estate company is for investment, um, you can overcome that. So what kinds of real estate companies do work? Well, ones that employ people are real estate brokerage firms, where you are actually employing, say, real estate agents, uh, real estate management companies. So just to give an example, we have had clients who are based, for example, in Hawaii, where you see a lot of Airbnbs, vacation uh, properties, and the E2 company is going to be in Hawaii and is going to basically clean up and repair those rental properties and take care of them when the owner is outside of Hawaii. So that could work as well because a real estate management company you're going to need to employ people who are going to um, go into the apartments and clean them after the Airbnb guest leaves. Uh, construction workers who are going to go in and repair these properties. Um, people who are in the administration area who are going to make sure that customers are paying, um, that you're marketing the services of the company. So for a real estate management company, it's pretty clear that it does require the services of US workers. Um, real estate renovation and construction companies, similar to management companies, if your business requires um, that you have workers who are going out and actually performing construction on properties, renovating them, 
um, that could be perfectly fine. So again, you're showing that you require the services of US workers. And finally, house flipping. House flipping can work. Um, we have seen it work, but what's important with house flipping is that you need to have enough properties to show that you you justify having several US workers. Um, if you are one person engaging in house flipping, which as, as we know does happen quite a bit, that's gonna be a real problem because again, you need to show you're creating jobs for US workers. So uh, again, at the end of the day, what this is really about is making sure that your real estate company is presented to the government in a way that, that the consular officer or USCIS sees that you really will require the services of US workers uh, in the business. We can go to the next. Excuse me. So as I mentioned, E2 visas for equity trading companies are very similar to those for uh, uh, real estate investment companies. Um, the problems you face are very similar. So placing stock in a portfolio in the name of an LLC <clears throat> as an investment will not qualify for the visa. Again, similar to investment properties, buying stock, <clears throat> putting it into an account and waiting for it to, an appreci to appreciate doesn't require the services of U.S. workers, or at least doesn't clearly or necessarily require them. So what you need to do in your application is make it very clear that, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. So you need to make it very clear that the business you are starting does require U.S. workers. So how do you do that? You would need to show in your business plan, if the business has not already started, you would do this in your business plan, um, that your clientele is going to be go beyond friends and family. You are actually going to be publicly marketing your services, um, that you are open to take on a, a number of clients. Um, and you need to show in your business plan, basically through those assumptions, you're going to have X number of clients. They are each going to invest an average of Y dollars uh, to service those clients. You're going to need employees who do A, B, and C. That's how you'll you'll need to map out your business plan to make it very clear that even though this is an equity trading or an investment company, it will require the services of U.S. workers. Now, the other thing you have to do for an equity trading company is show that you have the necessary licenses. So the SEC and FINRA, they all will license people who uh, who practice in these industries. So, you know, you have to take certain series uh, tests, make sure you have those licenses before you apply because the consulate in your interview, they're going to ask, or they can ask, if you get this visa, are you ready to take a flight tomorrow, show up in the US and start running this company? Is there anything you need to do that? And if you have to say, well, you know, I do need to get this license before I do that, that could be a basis for a denial because they they will say that the business is not actually real and operating. So make sure that to the extent possible, you have all of the licenses lined up to run this business. And again, these companies I'm talking about, real estate companies and equity trading or investment companies are innately risky. So if someone came to us and said, I want an E2 visa, this is my business, right off the bat, we would tell them uh, that while we do see these cases get approved, they are higher risk cases. So you need to go in knowing that because if a government official looks at the case and just sees real estate investment or just sees equity investment, they could deny the, the application based on that alone. Uh, so be aware, these are, these are innately risky types of companies. Um, again, that doesn't mean they will be denied. It just need, me, means that you need to be particularly deliberate about strengthening certain aspects of the application, like showing that you already have U.S. workers, for example, can help to overcome those challenges. We can move on. All right, so let's talk about some common reasons for E2 denials. And um, you know, we, we have already talked about a number of these. You've talked extensively about low investment amounts. Um, again, while there is no specific dollar amount, that's required for an E2, you do need to convince the government that you've invested enough to make the business operational, first of all, and second of all, that you're committed to the business. 
And that's why consulting companies uh, can be challenging because even if you've invested enough to get the business started, that might not be enough to convince the government that you're committed to the business because these are low cost businesses to start. Um, so a low investment investment amount is a common reason for an E2 denial. So how do you address that? Invest more if you can. Now, we never recommend that you put in money solely for the purpose of putting in money. Um, think about ways that that investment actually can create a return for the business. So for example, increase marketing, pay more for advertising, improve your website, improve the functionality of your website. Um, consider hiring an employee uh, who may be a, a marketing expert, who might be good at social media, who might be good at designing websites so that you have an employee on the books and you're improving your marketing. Um, these are just a few ideas. You might be able to pay for your office rent in advance. So maybe pay for three months, six months, even a year in advance to bolster the investment amount. Um, uh, you know, these these are really some of the top uh, ideas that we discuss with clients if they are really struggling to increase that investment amount. The second common reason for denials is what I mentioned before, the nature of the business. So if you're starting a real estate business, that alone uh, makes the uh, business a little riskier than it would be if you were, say, starting a corner store or something that more clearly will employ U.S. workers. Um, again, not that it can't be overcome. You just need to know as you're preparing the application to address that weakness. Third, the filing location or venue. Um, certain consulates are stricter than others. Certain consulates tend to see large E2 companies, so companies that have hundreds of employees, if not thousands of employees, um, and other uh, consulates tend to see smaller um, E2 companies. So if you are someone applying with a startup at one of these consulates that tends to see very large companies, you may be at a, at a disadvantage there. So one of the things we do with our clients is look at what um, consulates are options for them based on their citizenship, based on where they live, um, based on the rules of the consulates and whether they're accepting third country nationals and figure out strategically where the ideal location to apply is. Uh, so the location is important. The other location I'll mention is USCIS. Um, USCIS is an option if you're within the US. Uh, they do not issue visas, but they will change your status. So if you're in the US, say as a student, an F1 student, and you've just finished Say you're you're in the U.S. as a as an accounting student. You've gotten your degree, and now you want to start your accounting firm. Um, instead of going to a consulate outside the U.S., you could go to USCIS and apply for a change of status so that you uh, get E2 status within the U.S. And while you would need to stay in the U.S. to maintain that status, it could be a great option if you want to just get the business started. Um, Apply for that change of status, and when you do need to travel, submit the application to a consulate, go abroad, get the visa so that you can travel freely. But anyway, USCIS, um, sorry, give me one second. All right, I have a bit of a cold. I appreciate you all having some patience. So USCIS also has its pros and cons. One of the difficult things about USCIS is that they do closely scrutinize your investment uh, source, excuse me, your source of funds. Uh, so even though they tend to be more accepting of lower investment amounts, they will very closely look at where those funds came from. So again, you need to think about or uh, have an attorney think about what the pros and cons of your specific case are and what location is ideal based on those. Uh, a fourth common reason for denials is if you have a similar business abroad that did not employ you employ workers. Uh, so one of the fundamental requirements for any two, as Hugh mentioned, is you have to prove that you will employ U.S. workers. So if you don't already do that, you need a business plan that clearly shows how you will employ U.S. workers. Now, uh, 
if you submit your application and you know you you typically will submit a resume you typically will submit your work history along with your e2 application and that is going to show where you've worked in the past and if you had a similar business abroad and the consular officer asks about it and it just so happens that you never employed anyone at that business then the officer is going to wonder why should i believe that you will now employ us workers when you had a similar business abroad that didn't employ people. So it is a hurdle to overcome. Again, it's not impossible to overcome it, but you need to be very ready to explain what you are going to do to overcome that hurdle. Um, the cover letter is a great place to do that in the application, the business plan. Um, you could show how you've invested funds into the specific thing that needs to happen in the business so that you don't repeat what happened abroad, um, but again, show you, you sh convince the officer that you're going to employ workers. Uh, it's easier done if you have employed workers in the past. Um, issues with the adjudicating officer, unfortunately, um, whether at USCIS or at consulates, the person who is looking at your application has a lot of power, um, and really they can deny the application on almost any basis. Um, so fortunately, however, most officers are good, relatively good at what they do. They typically are knowledgeable about the E2 requirements and they're fair. Most officers are. Um, every once in a while, you do get an officer who is not. Uh, perhaps they're in a bad mood. Perhaps they don't know the requirements very well. Uh, perhaps they just have some doubt and they decide to deny the application. So you can run into a negative officer. Um, the plus side is if you are denied uh, at a consulate, there's nothing preventing you from applying again. So in, in the larger consulates, the consulates that actually have E2 uh, units such as Toronto, London, uh, Frankfurt. Um, if you apply again, they will oftentimes try to assign you to a different officer so that you get a different perspective. Someone else gives a perspective on your application. So that is a benefit. Um, but be aware, you know, when you are going into the interview, a lot depends on that person you're talking to. So you want to be respectful. You want to be very clear in your responses. Finally, we do sometimes have people come to us after they have applied, whether themselves or with another attorney, another law firm, and they come to us after a denial and we look at what was submitted and it's clear that they actually did not meet the requirements at the time they filed. They might not have had the required citizenship. They might not have actually spent the money that they moved into the business bank account, um, any number of things. So always go through the E2 requirements and make sure that you satisfy all of them before you apply. We can move on. <clears throat> All right, E2 visa adjudication trends. Uh, approval rates are fairly high. If you want to look into this yourself, the Department of State um, publishes statistics on E2s and really most visas. You can break it down by the post, by the consul consulate, and by the visa type. And what you'll see is that most E2 visa applications are actually approved. Um, I believe that approval rates are in the 80 to 90% range. Our approval rates are higher than that, somewhere around 98%. Um, if you read that fine print, it says past results do not predict future outcomes. We have to say that, and that is true. Um, so that is one trend, is that it's a trend that's that's actually not changed uh, based on the administration that the government does tend to does tend to approve these applications. Uh, another trend is the timeline. So during COVID, we were seeing very long waits. Um, to give one example, Rome was taking over a year from the date you submit the application to the date of the interview. Um, and that was just very frustrating. Uh, the average was probably somewhere around six to eight months around the world on E2 applications. Unfortunately, that's gotten much quicker. So as an example, Toronto right now, between the date you submit the application and the date of the interview is somewhere around one to two months. London is a little bit longer. I think it's around four months, uh, but still much faster than we were seeing in 2020 and 2021. 
So that's a good thing. USCIS versus consulates. Um, before COVID, we would rarely see USCIS change of status applications to E2. Um, I mentioned before USCIS is an option. If you're within the US, it is not a visa. So if you get E2 status through USCIS, the moment you leave the US, you abandon it. So you need to make sure you stay in the US if unless you have an appointment at a consulate to get the visa. A visa lets you come into and out of the US. Um, before COVID, as I said, almost 100% of applicants were going with the consulate because that gives you a visa. You can come in and out. Every time you come in, you get two years of E2 status, which is wonderful, even if you enter on the last day of your visa. Um, I already explained the downsides of USCIS, but during COVID, it was very hard to travel between countries. A lot of countries had uh, restrictions on travel. So many people were stuck here, didn't have the option of going to the consulate and consulates also were taking a year or longer. So we saw many, many more change of status applications filed with USCIS. Um, that trend has not gone back to before COVID. We still do have a number of clients who prefer to apply through USCIS, but certainly I'd say more people are opting for consulates. And again, I think that's a very reasonable and good thing. Uh, generally, we do recommend consular applications. Um, the, the final item here is post-specific considerations. So each consulate has its own instructions for E2 applications. Each consulate has its own preferences. As I said before, some see very large companies, some see smaller ones, some have their own e-visa units, some don't. Um, you don't necessarily have to apply at a consulate in an E2 treaty country either. So as an example, many uh, Brazilians um, have second citizenship in Italy or Germany, um, and Brazil is not an E2 treaty country. Italy is, Germany is. So we, you know, we file with some regularity E2 applications in Brazil, um, and it's, it's typically not a problem. So, you know, you, you can look at what consulates, what their rules are, what their policies are, and again, be strategic about where the application is filed. Finally, certain consulates do require a CPA certification on business plans. Singapore comes to mind. You'll you'll just need to be aware based on the instructions at the consulate. And we we of course do help our clients with that. We can move on. All right, issues in complex areas. Um, let's just run down these. Do I need to hire employees before I apply for an E2 visa? You do not, but you're, if you don't have an employees, your business plan needs to very clearly show how you will hire employees within five years of the business starting operations. Complicated source and trail of funds. This is not so much an issue with consulates, but USCIS, as I said, will scrutinize the finance, the financial records behind the source of funds. You can get your investment from a loan uh, as long as the loan is not secured by the E2 company. So if it's a personal loan, that's fine. Uh, gifts are generally fine as well. Just know that the person who gave you the gift is going to need to prove where they got the money from. So if your very friendly and generous brother gives you $100,000 uh, that he has earned from working the last 15 years, he will need to be ready to sh give those tax returns for the last 15 years, proving that he got his money from work. E2 visas for two investors. You Because the requirement is that you own 50% of the business, you can have two E2 investors. They would each need to own 50%. An interesting side note is if each of those investors is from a different E2 treaty country, then that company will have dual nationality. So if an Italian and a German each own 50%, they can hire nationals of Italy or Germany on E2 employee visas, assuming those employees qualify uh, as, as employees. But you can uh, basically sponsor workers from either country to come and work for the E2 company. Substantive changes to the E2 business after filing. This is a complicated area. Uh, you really define the scope of what your business is doing in the initial application, whether that's to USCIS or to the consulate. So if you have any thought of doing something broader than what is in the business plan, expand the business plan, make it broad. There's really no big downside 
to expanding what the business does if you really think there's a chance you'll be doing that. Because if you narrow the scope of the business, you get to the US and you decide, you know what, uh, I'm enjoying my consulting company, but I really want to start a coffee shop. Um, that's going to be hard to do without government approval. So before you make that change and start running that coffee shop, you need to get approval from either the consulate or USCIS. Um, changes in ownership are a, are a bit more binary. So if your ownership drops below 50%, you lose E2 status. So always make sure you have that 50% ownership if you're an E2 investor. Finally, family business purchases. Uh, just make sure that you are paying uh, the fair market value for a business. If you get a big discount on the business because you're buying it from your dad or your mom, then that can be a problem because the consulate may argue you did not invest a substantial amount in this business. You got a discount on it. So you didn't invest what the business required. My recommendation is to treat a family business purchase as you would any other business purchase. Bring in accountants, lawyers, document everything, show it's the fair market value so that when the government looks at it, you're backed up by that documentation. All right, good. We're at questions and answers and we only have a few minutes. So let's try to fly through these. I'm a Canadian citizen. I'd like to go to Florida over the winter and while there look for a business to buy. Do I need a visa for this? Great question. You, as a Canadian, your visa exempt not for an E2, but for pretty much any other visa with a few exceptions. You can enter the US um, in what is called B1 status. So when you, when you are speaking with the border officer at the airport or the land crossing, make it very clear that you are entering to engage in authorized business activities. You can Google that term, authorized business activities. You can Google B1 permitted activities. You can do things like meet with business brokers, uh, look at commercial spaces. You cannot work. You cannot earn an income from your work and you can't actively sell, but you can do certain activities like take steps to set up an E2 application. So again, make sure you're clear with the border officer if you do that. Um, Toronto does take issue if you enter on a B2 and you start doing that stuff, they have been known to take issue with that. They can be picky. Is it possible to apply for a green card while on E2 status? And um, can the substantial investment be made with another individual? So you can apply for a green card while you're in E2 status. It is a very uh, complex area that you, you. I really recommend you speak with an attorney about. You need to be aware of a number of hurdles uh, and risks. Uh, it is possible to do it, certainly, but you need to do it carefully. Um, and in terms of the sec second question, yes. I mean, if if you can, like I said, you can apply with two E2 investors, they would each need to invest a substantial amount. So if the business required $120,000 to get started or 80,000, you do want to show that each person is investing half of that. 80,000 I th would be low for two. So I would say bolster the overall investment amount ideally for each person hit. 60,000 if you can, again, depending on the post, uh, but you can split the investment amount. And, and I would recommend a consultation to talk through the details of that. Yes, two people together can invest in a US business. Uh, we are two friends together wanting to invest. Can we do that? You can. Two people can invest in the business. I, I think these are repeated questions. Would a mobile home park or self-storage business be considered for an E2 visa? You'd have to run through the requirements. I mean, off the top of my head, the issue you're going to face is um, employees. So you need to show that you you will need U.S. workers for the business. Um, so if you satisfy that and you show that it requires an investment that you've made uh, and that it, it is real and operating. So this is a legitimate business, then yes, it could qualify. How does it work if you need a real estate license to operate a real estate management company? So I think what you're getting at is you need to be in the US to get a license. So if there are aspects of the application that you need to be in the US to get, you have two options. One is to come to the US to get it. So for example, if you can get a license, while on a another visa, then you might consider doing that. Um, there are three options. That's one of them. Another option is you can contract with another professional who already has that license and they will essentially loan you their license 
until you get your own. And we, we actually will regularly do that for real estate companies. In the application, we have a copy of the other real estate professionals license and the letter saying, you know, we are going to allow so-and-so E2 applicant to use our license. Uh, we're going to stand in in that capacity until they get their own. So you can do that. And the final option, if if neither of those is is possible, then you can you basically have to prepare everything else in the application and be ready to explain to the consular officer that the only thing you're missing is the license and that you have to be in the U.S. to get it and that you've done everything you can. And once you're in the U.S., you're going to apply for that license So and, and hope that they are understanding, which oftentimes they will be. I'm a Canadian citizen married to an American citizen. Does this affect my E2 visa? Uh, it could. Um, not necessarily, but it could. Uh, you know, it, it's definitely not an automatic denial by any means, but you do need to be ready to explain to the consular officer that because the E-2 visa is a temporary visa. It's not a green card. You intend to leave the U.S. at the end of the visa. Okay, so if you're married to a U.S. citizen, it is very likely that they will ask, are you going to stay? Do you plan to stay in the U.S.? And you need to be ready to provide that answer. No, I plan to leave. Uh, here are my ties outside the U.S., et cetera. So just anticipate that question. What are major issues you have noticed with already existing liquor businesses in the US, um, no major issues beyond any other business. I mean, a liquor business is legal as opposed to a cannabis business, which we would not recommend because it's still prohibited or still has issues under federal law, but liquor is fine. Um, as long as you're gonna employ people and the investment amount is sufficient, um, should be a fine application. And in terms of our visa fees, um, contact us directly. We don't discuss those on, on webinars, but we'd be happy to share with you. Uh, if you want to schedule a consultation, we can discuss that. Or if you're ready to move forward, we can send our engagement letter and payment instructions. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. I think that covers everything. We're only three minutes over. Hugh, thank you for your thank expertise. You. And to our audience, thank you for the great questions. It's been a pleasure. Keep an eye out for our email. Please do sign up for future webinars and visit our YouTube channel in the meantime.